everybody, we have our three o'clock presentation by Dave. He's going to talk about the C64 board that he just made that he started building and got functioning just a week ago. Yes, and that's it right. fits into his casing over here. So uh, tell us all about it, Dave. All right, my name is Dave Maurer. I'm from Phoenix, Arizona, and I, I'm an electrical engineer working for Intel. And this is my second Convex I've come to. I was here last year. It was my first time. Um, I grew up, you know, using Commodores, and then I kind of fell out. And um, it's only within the last, you know, year and a half, two years, I started, you know, messing around with Commodore hardware I had and pulled it out of storage and started messing around with it again. Um, my main interest is just kind of hardware hacks and, and things like that. And so earlier this year, back in March, April time frame, I was thinking, well, I'd love to have some sort of like standardized ATX motherboard that I could just plug C64 chips into, use a standard ATX case, ATX power supply, not have to worry about, you know, does my does an old brick power supply work and um, worry about having to desolder chips every time something fails. So that was kind of like the main genesis of why I started this project. So what it is exactly, it's a, a micro ATX form factor board that uh, is a direct replacement for the chips that are either in the, the bread bins or in the early 64Cs. Um, it uses a standard ATX case in the power supply, um, and it's fully socketed. All of the chips are fully socketed for you know quick swap out and repair. Um, and it does use donor chips from the uh, bread bin or the early 64C boards. Um, the one chip that's not from the bread bin is the 8701 clock chip, which has to be sourced from a 64C or 128 or any of the other boards that have that. So that's the one chip that's not from the bread bin. So why do it? Because it turned out to be just a fun and interesting project to do, see if I could actually do it, since um, my background has been in uh, hardware and, and chip validation for a large number of years at Intel. And I've always been part of the design and uh, debug of these boards, but I never actually got to do one myself <coughs> for a home project. So that's one reason I did it. Um, also kind of wanted to do it to be able to extend the lifespan and of uh, you know, so the 64 systems and not rely on the bricks which fail and then burn out boards. Um, and put it in a modern case so I have something that's that I could like set on my desk next to my, my PC or something and I have to have so much desk space just for a, a 64. And and also to be able to recycle parts from dead 64s. I've got a I got a pile of 64s that are have failed for one reason or another and I decided, well, this would probably be a lot easier than trying to diagnose each board one at a time and make it work again. So I just pulled donor chips from all of those and plug into the new board. And I wanted to add some new features and capabilities that the old ones don't have. For instance, uh, I'd love to be able to add a, a USB or a PS2 keyboard port, which I don't have working on my prototype, but that's one of the things I'm going to work on for the, for the, the next version of the board. Um, and have a few other things that make it update the 64 a little bit. Um, so the board itself is based off of the, the B3 rev of the 64C schematic. Um, and uh, I took that and then laid it out in a micro ATX form factor board, which will fit in just about any ATX case, whether it be a tower or desktop or slim, slim type. Uh, micro ATX case, um, and it uses a standard ATX 2.x power supply to get the 5 volt, 12 volt rails off of there. Um, uh, as I said before, all the chips are socketed, uh, so it's easy to swap them out. And I do have an S-Video connector on it to plug it into more modern uh, monitors, or if you you have a monitor that only has an HDMI input, then you know for you can go to Amazon and get an S video to HDMI connector, and that will you know you can connect it up to a monitor that way too. Um, I did add a front panel header like the an ATX motherboard that has the for room for a reset switch, a power LED, um, power, and I'll probably do uh, the uh, uh, I don't have it wired up on my prototype, but the the speaker header. So if you wanted to do an internal speaker just for the audio. Generating 9 volts? Yes. So what I do is I have a 12 to 
nine volt regulator on the board to get the nine volts out, but it's nine volt DC, so the board doesn't have any the nine volt AC at all. So that means the real time. So what? Yeah. So I end up having to uh, add a, a circuit to generate the real time the clock. So. And it's also got a circuit so that you can do the push button ETX uh, uh, on off switch. And it has right now my prototype board has two headers for cooling fans, and I might add more just you know for you know uh, placement of you know front rear and extra fans in case if you wanted, or if you wanted to actually put like uh, fans directly on some of the chips that get really hot, like the big chip, the SID chip, etc. Um, and the I was able to source a lot of new and new old stock parts to to, to stuff the board. With. So the only parts I had to uh, pull from old donor boards were the old MOS chips. That, that was pretty much it. Um, I'll go through some of the changes that I made. Uh, does not have the 9 volt AC power line. Um, I'm using an LM7809 regulator to go from 12 volts to 9 volts for all the 9 volt rails. Uh, I removed the cassette port just for space reasons and I didn't have much use for a cassette port and, and I don't have any cassette equipment to plug in. Um, the RF modulator is removed, and it's only got the chroma and luma signals from the RF port routed to the S video connector. I did remove the on the 8 pin video connector, but I might add it back in just in for people who want to connect it up to a, a you know an old 1702 monitor. Um, and I routed the user ports and the joystick ports to a header, and then have uh, and that way you could uh, you know you customize it and have. Say if you wanted to have uh, uh, you know a PCI slot connector for joystick ports or the user port, or and even the the uh, the, uh, the, you know, the DB25 port for a, um, a 128 DCR keyboard, and then you can hook it up that way. Um, and then I added the timer circuit to generate the, the time of day clock, and um, the audio in and output jacks are routed to a uh, uh, you know a standard. Uh, uh, earphone header. So, uh, any questions so far? I have a question for you. Okay. The joystick port is that protected? Um, no, and I I didn't do it for space, but I'm probably going to add you know the protection back in, so you know that we don't blow out the, the CIA every time you plug it in. So I'm, I'll probably add that back in in the final version. Yeah. Would it be out of question to add a header well, I'm sure removing the, the cassette port was not a matter of edge card. Well, there yeah, there's, there's a, some transistors. Yeah, some transistors in there, so I'd have to add that back in too, and then have some sort of head header that can go out to an edge connector. So here's all the donor parts I have I pulled from. Uh, 64 boards for my prototype, which you know, CIA, all three ROM chips, PLA, the CPU, the VIC, um, and the SID. And I should be able to put in a, a PAL version of the VIC just with the crystal swap out. Um, I don't have any PAL parts to test it out with, so, but it, it should be able to be done. And then also, I've got it wired up to use either the newer or the older uh, SID chips, you know, as a jumper for the voltage change. And and the and the resistor changeover for the the SIDs, and also I'm using the 8701 clock clock chip, which is kind of rare because it's not on the bread bin. It's only on the, the 64Cs or the 128. So that might be that's one of the harder to source parts from from donor boards. And then also on my prototype, I had to pull off the expansion port connector from an old board since those are hard to find too. Uh, Dave, um, instead of an 8701, how about a 7701 from the Brown C64? I believe it's, well, um, if it's pin compatible, it should work. I haven't looked at the 7701 and which revision of the board actually carried that. I don't remember which. Uh, so I can't remember. I know it was in the Brown C64. Is there anything, s what's special about the clock signal that couldn't just be generated with modern? Um, I'd have to find a chip that, that uh, switches between NTSC and PAL from the clock chip out. So that because the 8701 is what generates the NT and selects between NTC and PAL okay. clock to the that it's routed to the bit. So, okay. 
So your so your board is meant to be either NTSC or PAL. Yes. Yeah. It should. Yeah, there's a. Um, I have not tested it, but the, the hardware hookup is there. Let's put it in PAL. Mode. I think in, like, even an AT tiny could probably be used um, to generate a compatible yeah, for some other clock divider chip that, that can provide the, you know, the 8 megahertz and 1 megahertz output. Right? Yeah. So, so some of the things in the future for the, the next revision of the board I want to do is to, to add support for a USB keyboard, um, add in a spot for a second SID chip, and then have a jumper to select the, the address offset. Um, Re-add in the 8-pin DIN video connector for for old monitors. Um, add USB headers so you can plug in. Say so if you wanted to plug in the standard USB connector from the case and, and just have it supply power for whatever device you've got, so, and then you know add that back in. Uh, more fan headers, and then also Jim suggested adding in an IEC header for the 5041 emulators. And have the, that way you have an internal connector for whatever emulator or real drive you wanted. And then anything else, if anybody's got any good ideas, it would be really nice um, to see on the board. Um, okay. And you just have a header for the user port? Yeah, right now it's just a header. Yes. Yeah. Have you thought about what you're going to do for the USB keyboard transition? Uh, a little bit. I, I just haven't really worked on it a whole lot yet. So, um, yeah, that's one. That's probably the biggest thing I'll have to work on. Okay. Yeah. What, what about uh, accelerators? Um, like Jiffy DOS plug in or well, or like the uh, uh, CMDs. Um, I don't know. I, have to, I haven't tested them out, so yeah, I, have to, I don't have any you know, the old accelerator hardware to test out on the board. So yeah, that'd be interesting to see. Yeah. The engineering is super CPU. Super yeah. CPU sitting right there. Yeah. <laughs> Get on it. <laughs> So um, here's a picture of like, you know, last week when I first got it up and running at home. Um, and I started the layout in April, got it finished up at the end of June, right, to send it off to, to Fab, and then got it back, you know, a week and a half later. And then last Friday I had it up and running for the first time. And yeah, so, so far so good. So did it boot the first time? Um, the first time I powered it on, I, I it was stuck in a reset. And I looked at my schematic and I realized I named the nets, oh, the, re, the internal reset, uh, two different net names, so I had to do a blue wire between them. So. <laughs> but after that, yeah, it powered on. Came out of reset. So. You have to worry at all about signal integrity stuff, or does it really not matter? It doesn't seem to matter too much, although um, I it, the. One thing I have seen that's a little sensitive that I might need to look at again it is the uh, the signaling for the NTSC clock. It's a little susceptible to to noise, so I probably have to like route that a little better. So that, yeah, going from one layer to another is yeah pretty neat. Cool. Is it a two layer process? Yeah, it's a two layer board. Yeah. It's just kind of hard to route. And the, I used TiCad to route the board, and it had fits routing. The two layer board with all the, the dip sockets. So, yeah. So, I ended up having to route some stuff by hand just to get around. But I think all the calendar boards are too. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Are you using it for your RAM? Are you using modern chip for? Yeah, I'm using the, the two chip uh, RAM. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, what is it? 41474s. Yeah. So, that, that was another thing that I'm going to look at and see how feasible it is to add, like, you know, the old RAM expansion or like a, a, a SIM slot for more RAM. So, yeah. So, if you have there's a couple of um, bank RAM solutions out there that are pretty much you just gotta open up and yeah. do the mods on the board yourself. Okay. Yeah, but it would be neat if that way. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'll look into it and see if I can get it to happen on this board, sure. Yes. Um, anything besides S video? Uh, right now, it's either the S video or the uh, standard, you know, uh, composite interface. Uh, to, okay. Yeah. Um, I'm slowly running out of devices in my house that can interpret that. Yeah, and uh, the only solution I've seen is like uh, these little boxes that they sell on Amazon that go from S video to HDMI output. You can get. So that's one solution. It would be nice to get a Thunderbolt, because then I could just plug it into my Mac, and it would be a video <laughs> input. Set it up for capture and live preview. It would probably be more than what it costs to make the board. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Um, if you have any other questions, or if, if you have suggestions, here's my email. And um, also, I, I have no idea how much interest this would have. So. I'm going to try, I haven't had time to do it yet, but set up like some sort of blog page and at least some posting on the various forums if people are interested. And then I can, you know, get the changes made and then hopefully have some boards up. Yeah. Cool. I would buy one. Yeah, me too. <laughs> All right. Cool. Yeah, email me if you have interest. Yeah. Yeah. What's the projected cost of the board you might bring? Um, right now, based on what my prototype costs, I'd say anywhere from 150 to 200 bucks per board. Other questions? Okay, thank you, Dave. Oh, and one other thing is oh, over there. Okay, it's okay. currently running over there in the corner on the screen over there, so. Yep, yep Spivers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank, you. thank you, Dave.